So we added that example. Then uh, the resolve, so there's three data sets that uh, were collected over Fupronong that are airborne yam. And we looked at two of them in this paper. So there's both the resolve and then the SkyTem high moment. So there were two resolve surveys flown. I forget when the first one is, but the second one was 2008. So that's these data. And then the SkyTem here. So the first example that we do, um, there's a white dot here. So we picked just one location where there was a sounding from each and then just show that inversion. Um, so here, uh, we started with the resolve inversion, um, fit those data. So there's five frequencies um, fitting both real and imaginary. So we inverted that. Um, get back like a big resistor near the surface and then it's much more conductive at depth. So that's actually, you know, over a seam per meter. Um, and then the sky temp, what we did is we started that inversion um, with the, or sorry, we started them both with the same um, model, but then we used the resolve inversion as a reference for the sky temp inversion because we don't expect it to have as much sensitivity near surface, so wanted to see more so if there's much difference between them. And then we went in and did uh, a 1D stitched inversion of the resolve data. We heavily downsampled it because we wanted it to basically, like you can actually run this example on your laptop. It takes an hour or so. Um, do yeah. For Travis. <laughs> is that one running? Um, no. So what we do for Travis on this one is we save the inversion results and download and plot them. Yeah. Um, but all of the code to actually run the inversion is still there. There's just a like, good if comment. you want to rerun it, go for it. If not, then you should download and plot That's it. That's a good idea. There's a couple examples that do that. So that one does that, and then the casing example does that. Because this one actually is too heavy to run on your laptop because it is a full 3D problem. Um, so this one does a primary, secondary, 
um, between the sill mesh and a 3D mesh. So we actually compute derivatives all the way up through um, on, like, including on the primer. Um, so what we did here is simulate basically a, a grounded source. So we've got one electrode grounded on the top of the casing and then a return 10 kilometers away. Simulate the cylindrically symmetric part. I call that the primary. And then we map those fields to the 3D uh, and simulate that for the secondary bone. And then this example, what we did is actually go in and compute the sensitivities. Uh, sorry, let me go back here. With respect to each of these parameters. So it's a parametric model mm -hmm. of describing this block in a layered space. Um, so the goal here was to sort of be able to ask the question, like, how sensitive am I to the width of the block? Um, and so that example, then there are a few plots where we show the primary fields, show the secondary problem. So you just have current density in the 3D block that we didn't capture in the primary. And then um, these are what the data look like. Oh, that's weird. That's just how the screen rendered. Huh. And then we go in and actually show the sensitivities as well with respect to each of those parameters. So this example is actually already up on the docs. And this one, again, like downloads the results and plots them. Um, but all of the code to actually reproduce this is still there. So yeah. And I actually re-ran this in between sort of the first revision and the second. And like, it was pretty minor to upgrade the small examples, which is nice. Yeah, so when we pushed all that to the docs, just like the number of examples and, you know, downloading stuff takes time and the cumulative effect of that um, put us over time on Travis. And so what I've done is now we're stashing a build of the docs and we'll only test things that change. Okay. Um, and so that Smart. has cut it down. Oh, quite a bit. Yeah, why, why are we testing things that haven't, haven't changed? Yet? Yeah. Um, so if you get in trouble, it's go to major, major change of the core code, then it, would, it might choke on it. Yeah, we'll see. It should, uh, we'll have to try it out. Um, you do it in blocks, worst case. Yeah, the, the challenge with that right now is that um, in order to get that up and running, required a lot of work with Google. And right now, their core packages only work on Python 2.7. Because oh. um, I guess um, Guido, who like is the yeah, Python benevolent dictator for life, uh, he worked at Google for a while and was basically like experimenting with ideas for Python 3 while he was there. So a lot of their code is like really hard to upgrade because he did some like fancy things in there. So they're having trouble getting some stuff upgraded. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, yeah, so in this case, the examples are not tested on Python 3, which is unfortunate. Um, we can write a specific test for that and get that back up and running later on. But the, all the commands on Python 3 works on Python 2, right? Yes, um, but the the danger with not testing them on Python 3 is there's potentially some things that we would just miss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like strings and stuff like right, that. Right, right, right. Um, so I'll probably let this through for now and then write just a separate test that only tests the examples, just that they run. And then that solves that problem. So basically all the all the all the tests on Travis are gonna, uh, for all the, the PRs are gonna go much much faster, I assume no? Not much, much faster now. Okay. Um, so it's still so the build right now, um, yeah, so that one I actually have to go fix again and remove the link check. Yeah, so it still takes you know half an hour um, on a lot of these. And because we're actually running so many of them, they don't all run in parallel. They only give you maybe six or seven at a time. Um, there are some things we can actually do to speed up the EM tests. Uh, the way we're building the problems and actually solving them right now is a little silly, is that for every single test, we're resolving the EM problem, um, like refactoring the matrix, all this sort of stuff, mm -hmm. where we could actually store that and then just
make sure that all the sensitivities are correct. So that's something that we can, yeah. Do we know, do you have a breakdown for a, a, each example, how much time they're, because mm -hmm. we have it, like it's kind of putting them in the, in that uh, log, log file, right? But do we have it tabulated somewhere? Uh, so there's two things that happen is it, it does, it is output in the, the Travis log. Yeah. Um, so you can see it if we go here. It's just a painful thing to, to read them. The other thing that you can do um, is actually on the SIMPEG docs, I'll go to the dev docs for now, um, is on each example it tells you how long it took to run. Okay. So, we so if we look at this guy. I think the MT are taking a long time to run. The 3D MT one, yeah, so this one. That's nothing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the 3DMT one is expensive because it's a, I think we're solving a 30 cube over a number of frequencies. Yeah. It's only like five minutes, I think. But when you only have 50, that's, oh, I'm not actually. That might be that's a three. Yeah. Uh, is that the one? No, that's a three. three. Oh, that's not bad. Yeah. What also takes time is actually building this page. So not only the, the code, but actually going through and then like, because it appends, like it also builds you a Jupyter notebook and the Python script, mm. so. You gotcha. Cool, well, good job. So that works. Um, it's more maintenance stuff. The other thing, what else are we? Um, so we've been working on this MT tutorial. We're writing a tutorial for the leading edge. I don't know if you've ever seen those. Um, Matt Hall organizes them. No, no, I haven't. And so they're actually, they're a great publication through the SEG. They're the only open source publication that the SEG has. Um, and so, and with each of them, there is code. So we wrote one a while back on on finite volume and just sort of walking through like what the mesh class looks like in SIMPEG. Um, so let's go to view. What motivates the MT one actually? I was wondering that the other day. Uh, so the motivation for that uh, came from the disk. And so in this case, what we wanted to be able to show is um, a 1D inversion that brings in a few complications. So it's a little more complicated than just a linear problem. Um, and so showing how to deal with the nonlinear version and then going in and showing the impacts of regularization. So I can actually show you briefly what the examples that we're showing here. So uh, they wanted to be able to go in and show sort of the classic MT example of non-uniqueness. So we've got um, a layer and there are five of them here, and we're just preserving conductance in each of these models. And so, I mean, if you add just a little bit of noise to this, you're not going to be able to tell the difference. Um, and then in the inversion, we also wanted to show some examples of just underfitting, overfitting, um, as well as the impacts of the alpha S versus um, alpha Z. So the smallness versus the smoothness. Um, and so here we're showing when we actually reach the target misfit, you know, you get a reasonable model. When you underfit, there's structure that we've missed. Uh, and when you overfit, it goes a little crazy. crazy. <laughs> yeah, and so the, the notebooks there will walk through how to set up like a SIMPEG style problem and survey. So that if you actually wanted to go in and code up your own problem and your own inversion, um, there's a resource for that. That's great. And uh, how much time does it take to run this? Oh, it's quick. Seconds. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Sweet. So it's pretty quick. I shall look at it. Perfect. <laughs> I shall <it> too. <laughs> yeah, it would be great to get your input, particularly on the notebooks. I can circulate that link later today. Um, and you're, you're running up um, 
I'm your PR right now. That's not from, is it straight from Dev? Uh, this is on EM Dev. Um, so yeah. there's the things that'll come in that changed are Tebow added the analytic for MT. Um, and so right now we are actually comparing the, the numeric results with that to make sure it makes sense and explain some things about match design. Um, and then the other thing that's coming in is Soggy added a directive to do plots like um, yeah, yeah, yeah. these, yeah. which is really nice. Yeah. Yeah. So that is a very useful thing to have. So those two things will come in on that EM dev pull request. So hopefully we'll have it by the end of the week. Um, it was just that Travis hang up. Cool. And he's storing all the uh, all the models too, I think. Yeah. Yeah, for this for this example, for we stored all of them. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, then you can go and scroll through, and exactly. there's a little widget he wrote um, that I quite like. Oh, maybe it's not in this one. Yeah, so I think probably just need to run. Uh, it's in this one. Uh, so okay. actually, scrolling through your iterations. Your iterations. That's great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. So following up from last week with the regularization, um, what I think I've got a pull request on, or not quite, because I was dealing with this other, but I can show you what it'll do. Um, so, as we talked about, there was no need to have both the uh, the mesh and the regularization mesh. So in the regularization, we actually build a separate mesh with all of its operators, so we can deal with things like active cells and um, only take derivatives inside as opposed to dealing with the boundary condition. Um, and so previously, we were storing both of these, but there's no need for that. We just, the only reason that the mesh is used is to create this regularization mesh. And now when you define a any sort of combo um, regularization, so like T can off where we've got the smallness and smoothness contributions, now all of them, the, the regular regularization mesh is linked um, and the mapping is linked. So all of those properties that you would want to be able to set on your top level regularization are now linked, mm -hmm. so that'll that'll propagate through. Um, and so, are, are they still they both they all going to have their own reg mesh, or uh, or they are looking at the same? They're all looking at the same mesh. Yeah, and so in this case, um, what I added to do that is basically said when we create um, a regularization that is composed of smaller regularization pieces, these things should all be the same. And so that is now also tested um, based on the example that you sent. So just making sure that the, the mapping is the same, the mesh is the same, um, and that you can change them and that they all still um, that propagate. Sure. So because now they are all looking at the same uh, object. So that's all good. You too. Yeah. Um, I think for the paper, you wanna you wanna help me with the minimum curvature? Yeah. If we can solve the minimum curvature, it's gonna it's gonna be great for us. Yeah. <laughs> do you wanna um plug in and talk a little bit about that paper, or do you want me to pull it up? Um. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, pull it up. Put you on spot. Pull it up. <laughs> um. Oh, it's actually right here. Um, do you have the uh, the meeting? Sorry, the last week every every week we're doing updates. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, week before, I guess. Oh, no, maybe. This one I published this morning. Oh. So. 
you should do that at the beginning of the meeting. We should look at the last week's uh, news. Uh, oh, yeah. That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, Lindsay and I are working on a, on a way to go from structural points from a surface map to populate the 3D volume of orientations to be able to reorient the, uh, the regularizations, to be able to like force continuity of uh, it's a fold or. So we need to go from surface points, a few points on the surface of oriented vectors to full, full 3D space. And I thought minimum curvature would be perfect for this. Um, you know, Eric De Kemp of the GSC has done quite a bit of that style of work. What's his name? Sorry. Eric De Kemp. Okay. I'll look it up. Actually, that's where the, the modules, the sparse modules in GoCAD come from. Oh, okay. Okay. But it was GSC work that, uh, that was done that was specifically for taking strike and dip measurements on surface yeah. and using them to create constraints to build 3D models. Okay. okay perfect. perfect. And that's just pretty much exactly what we are where we're looking to. Oh shoot, I forgot about this. I have a, I have a new thing. Um I might have to uh, I might have to get out. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, no, he's done. But yeah, so if Lindsay could help us, because uh, we're having trouble right now. When we're interpolating, it's kind of going out to zero on the on the outside. Right. Instead of uh, instead of just populating the values everywhere. So for like something weird, so the vectors are are oriented good. If yeah. I renormalize the length all the bit for all at once, it's it's rotating properly. But the, the length of the vectors all going to zeros on the on the edges. Okay. Yeah. And is this in the notebook that you sent me? I, I will send you the, the notebook. Okay, perfect. It's so right now we're using like a like a relaxation methods. So right. we're starting with those values and then averaging a bunch of times until that, that the message gets gets through. Yep. But I think we can solve it as a PDE instead with boundary conditions. Mm -hmm. it's, it's Atlassian, right? So yep. we just need to, to solve it. And, and it would be uh, faster. Yeah. And then if we have this, then then we're done with the paper. That would be great. Yeah. Okay, there's some work that was done also um, in Australia that they use a um, an inversion method, Bayesian inversion. I'm trying to remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, they have a 3D modeler that they have built, which does the same thing. I'm not sure exactly how it does it. Okay. I'm trying to, um, that's uh, Desmond um, Fitzgerald. Right, I'll send that to you. Desmond Fitzgerald. Okay. Um, they built the, um, I'm trying to think what his company's called, but they, they built all the um, <coughs> potential field data storage and display systems for Axel. Oh, okay. Okay. And uh, he has a and they have a 3D modeling package which builds models yeah. from dips and strikes on the surface. I'm not sure what algorithm they use. Okay. Okay. And so for the examples you're interested in, these are um, frequency domain. Well, our, our EM system is a, is a Vulcan CSCM system. So okay. we have a um, electric current dipole mm -hmm. and with its frequency domain. Uh, and we uh, have uh, E field and H field receivers. And do you have three components? Our, or... our total receivers measure three components, only E field. Okay. Okay, but the C floor receivers measure. Uh, Basically, horizontal components of the E of the E field and the H field. Okay. And would you deploy both of those together, or not typically? Normally, yes. I mean, what we're starting to this year, we was the first time we'll be doing it. But the classical methods, 2D methods that have been used, classical. That's the wrong word, I guess, but. Yeah, it's been regularly done, okay? Yep. Deploying both, but when we were doing the 3D work, pulling 
tight receivers. We didn't do it. Okay. Didn't put receivers on the seafloor. We only tow it behind the transmitter. But now we're putting transmitters on the seafloor, mm -hmm. and we have a roving E field receiver. Okay. That's actually on a on an AUV. Oh. Okay. Wait. So you've got your transmitter on the seafloor, and you're moving. Moving. The, we're flying the receiver around okay. it. Okay. Yeah. And in that case, you you it's three components of the E field. Really? That's correct. Okay. Huh. Mirroring the magnetic field is more difficult, but it actually we might start doing that also. Yeah. It's a cool problem because we don't have um, like reciprocity hooked up yet. Um, well, but in this case, you wouldn't. CGI has been doing it for us. Yeah. Okay, but they use a lot of horsepower to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know, but for um, some simple simple modeling, there's a few examples. Um, so, let me see, what's that? Um, so I've done a bit of work with the casing side of things, um, and that shows some grounded sources. So. So one of the things that might potentially be useful um, is we actually now have a 3D cylindrical mesh, and it is, it's not actually in the core package yet. Um, But what's nice about it is if the geology is simple, um, you can do a really good job of finding sort of um, vertically. And then in this case, I was interested in the casing, so we're finding that very well. Um, but then doing a coarse refinement in theta. So in this case, what I did is the wire path comes out here. Um, and I've run a few tests looking at you know, what happens if we stick actually a horizontal dipole. And so that is breaking a bit of the symmetry. Um, but you know, our Earth is layered. And you can still do a decent job as long as you're choosing the right formulations and things like that. And it's a it's a reasonably fast simulation. Um, so this is something that you could also consider playing around with um, for the EM uh, marine EM problem is sticking a, a grounded source uh, sort of near the center here. And then if you're starting with layered geology, it's not a bad way to go. But if you do actually want like isolated targets. You can do that with this, um, but the geometry is a little more challenging because now we're dealing with pie wedges and things like that. Yeah, but I mean, that's not a problem, is it? No. No, it's just it's sometimes, as long as you get enough discretization, you're probably OK. Yeah. 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 And especially if your target is um, near the center of this mesh, it's, it's fine. Um, Could you uh, say run a two-stage process with a coarse grid to identify where the targets were uh, to drop a cylindrical mesh on the target? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's a, a definitely doable yeah. option. Yeah. Yeah, and um, the right there's a few pieces that would be needed in terms of like interpolation between those two meshes. Um, we have it for going from a 2D cell mesh to the 3D Cartesian, but um, from the 3D cell mesh, we just haven't had that up yet. So, yeah. That's basically it for my updates this week. Um, let's see. Okay, this stuff here. Or if there's any questions you want to go over, or, um, resources I can point you to, or I can give you a tour of just like how we work, if that's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit of a newbie, you know. I, so I mean, I'm, when things happen, I'm not sure exactly what's going on. Um, yeah. I find I can write simple Python scripts. Mm -hmm. I can kind of understand what's going on in it, you know, yeah. but I haven't had enough practice with it too to be 
confident that yeah. I can, but I'm, I'm comfortable with it. Okay. And, um, um, One thing that um, has been valuable to us is Slack. Uh, have you ever signed you up for this? Or if you're interested, this is just like a message board, basically. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, and so this has been a good place to actually just ask questions and we post updates and things like that here. So if there are changes coming to the code base, this is generally one of the first places that that will be announced. Um, we're also working on maintaining a blog, just talking about things that are happening. Because um, I know, you know when developments are happening, we all, of course, are in the loop because we're here and talking with each other, but that's not always transmitted beyond us. Um, so that is now, I think there's a link from our website. If not, we can create one. Yeah, there's not actually. So we found Medium, um, medium.com slash simpedic. And for the most part, it's just sort of examples and sort of seeing what people are up to. Um, they're all pretty short, but it can give you a bit of a feel for what's going on. Intrepid. That's the name of the company that uh, has built this modeling system. Products. Show modeler. So here's, you see this geological editor implicitly models 3D surfaces. That's exactly the problem that you're. Oh, okay. Nice. Oh, you got it on there, Peter? Perfect. Thanks. And, uh... Yeah, here at the camp. Sparse, those are the keywords you want to look at for the other one. Eric DeCamp? DeCamp. K E M P. So he's got an article in interpretation. Oh, perfect. Spot. Is this one here? Okay. Introduction to specials. Okay. So that'll probably give you a lead into those two groups of workers anyway. They're, Perfect. they're both independently doing what you're doing. Tibo, where did you, you post that in me? Oh, okay. Cool. All right. Um, yeah, so that's basically it for me. I'll try and get these EM updates in um, within a day or two, because we need those to then send back the EM paper. I'm happy to send you the link if um, it's up on the archive. Uh, right now. So I'll update this um, once we've submitted the new version, because um, right now this version does not include the boot pronoun uh, inversion. 
but um, it'll still be accessible through the same link. So if you just look for archive electromagnetics in my name, um, it should come up. Cool. Okay, I know I, Craig, was there anything you wanted to, to bring up? Hi guys, uh, no, nothing in particular. I just thought I'd listen in and catch up. Perfect, well, thanks for joining. No problem. When's uh, Sagi back? Soggy is back. Uh, well, he's not actually back for another like month. All right. Okay. So Soggy are in. Uh, they're in Korea right now, and they're heading to uh, Kyoto. I guess later today, actually. Okay. Uh, so Doug will be back at the end of the month, but Soggy is spending an extra few weeks in Korea at the tail end. So. Okay. So kind of like end of July or so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and. Um, He's been posting the um, live streams of Doug's course on Slack. Um, so if you're interested, we can send you, I think there's a couple that are decent quality. It's always hard depending on like how the internet connection is doing. Um, but we've got, we've tried to capture the course in every location that we've, uh, that's gone so far. Great. All right. Um, well, I think that wraps this up then. So we will talk with you guys next week. All right. Thanks, Craig. Ciao.